Today, I'm going to talk to you about platforms, platform engineering, and how reality is a bit more complex sometimes than we expect it to be. A bit, if you don't know me yet, um, I used to be a data scientist in university for like seven years. Germany, China, different countries. And then uh, nine years ago, I switched into the cloud native space, working with Docker, working with a lot of technologies. As a DevRel person, developer advocate, I got my CKA at some point, got a bit more technical, and then switched to product. I'm now the VP of product at Giant Swarm, and I'm also a CNCF ambassador. And today, we are going to talk about something that I've been working on quite a lot within Giant Swarm, but also upstream, and that's uh, platforms and platform engineering. Basically, everyone's talking about platforms these days, and there's going to be uh, there's, there's, there was like so many KubeCon talks already. I hope I don't need to define platforms by now. And um, I think the most interesting part for me is that we now have an upstream workgroup called Workgroup Platforms or Platforms Workgroup within the tag App Delivery. There's been a white paper published, I think, early this year, which is really nice. This graphic is from that. So if you haven't read that uh, platform white paper, really recommend it. Soon to be published, there is a platform maturity model, and we just kicked off uh, work on a platform as product paper, which also has a research part. So if you're an end user and you want to particip participate, then hit me up later so we might set up some qualitative interviews there. Um, the white paper, I think the most important part of that white paper for me was that it stated that, yeah, a bit trivially, you might say, developer platforms should be enabling developers, right? But sometimes we forget that. And restating the goals of a platform team is important to think about where our focus should be as platform products and platform people. And the three goals that the platform t uh, white paper t tells us to are, are the top goals of a platform team is first researching platform user requirements and planning a feature roadmap, which is basically very basic product work, right? But when it gets into where it gets interesting is the second goal is about marketing and evangelizing the platform. Because if you build it, they won't come sometimes. Especially in a big company, if you build a platform, people might not even know about it. Like there's uh, maybe different platforms competing at the same time. So you need to actually actively go out and get people to use your product. And this is where the third part comes in, is you need interfaces, documentation, APIs, how people will use your product. You need to meet your end users where they are. If you're an organization that lives in Confluence, maybe documentation in Confluence is nice. If you're an organization where your developers live on the CLI, you need CLIs. If they want to automate things and you want to enable them to integrate what you have as a platform into their platforms, you might need more of an API, direct API approach. So oftentimes you need a mix of all of those. And especially if you have a lot of different interfaces, something like a developer portal also would, might make sense because discoverability of platform services and capabilities is oftentimes a problem, especially the bigger you get. And I couldn't agree more with all of these goals, but in reality, when you look into platform engineering and platform teams, you oftentimes see we don't have the time to focus on these things. We're always like on the run, and the reality looks a bit like this. This is an actual picture of me um, working on platforms. <laughs> and it sounds like really nice. Your, your mission is to like, enable developers, right? And your mission sounds pretty straightforward. Just put some Kubernetes there and then build a platform that's backstage, just put it in front of it. It's all going to be nice, right? But then like actually managing the life cycle of all the clusters that you have, maybe on different clouds, maybe on premise, managing API deprecations over time, maybe every four or five months if you go to the next version, then going through basically this whole CNCF landscape, choosing the tools is not easy. It's uh, it's, a, it's a task, it's 24-7, right? 
right? It's like every KubeCon we have like new versions, new tools, new projects being announced, and it's really nice. It's it's exciting, but it also creates a lot of frustration and stress for a lot of platform teams because we also have might sometimes competing products, and you don't know what to choose. And if you choose the wrong one, what happens? And that's only to set up your platform. Then you have maintenance, you have bug fixes, you need to ensure security, have your regulations in there, you build your company glue in between all of these things. And then sometimes, because it's open source, you might be forced to actually contribute yourself. And this is sometimes really cool. This can be really rewarding, this can be a great career for yourself, but sometimes it also distracts from the main job that you had to enable the developer. And to refocus on that, we need to shift our mindset a little bit. And the mindset, this is not just for the product owner. This is not just like hire some product people, put them in their pl uh, platform teams, and you're going to be done. These people and you as an organization need to understand that the mindset of the platform engineering teams needs to shift towards uh, a product mindset, towards a mindset that has the point of view of the developer in mind. And two tools that I would like to give everyone from kind of the, the product space, but that work for every engineer, we've used them internally quite a lot, are one job to be done and user journey mapping. And jobs to be done basically means look at what is the job that your end user wants to do. Right? They might come actually to you and say, I want Grafana, right? or I want Instana, I want something, I want this tool. I've seen it on a KubeCon, I want it. Right? But that's not their job, that's not what they want to solve. Right? They don't even need really observability, that's not a, a job to have. That might be a job description for some people, but it's not a job that like, solves a problem for a company. It's usually that they have issues either in testing or production and they want to debug it. And for that they need data and maybe some dashboards and and, and you need to, again, meet them where they, where they prefer it. Some organizations really like to keep all the observability on CLI level and only switch to, the, uh, to dashboards in, in some historical cases. So you need to understand this, this concept of thinking about what is the job that the, that the developer wants to achieve and how can I help them achieve it irregardable of the tool irregardless of the technology. And the, the, the most famous example, most probably, for jobs to be done and that makes it really understandable is it's usually if you go somewhere and you want to like, uh, buy a drill, it's usually not that you need a drill. You need sometimes a hole in the wall and most probably that's not even your job. You want to hang a picture. And there's different ways to hang a picture. Maybe you use some 3M tape or some other means of like projecting the picture on the wall. That's the goal that you have. It's not to get a hole in the wall or use a drill. That's not your goal. And similarly, this is how we need to think about uh, our features. And this makes us focus more away from the tooling and more on, on what we want to actually achieve. And another th tool that we've re recently been working, and this is actually from Miro, from my Miro, like a few months ago, We've tried to use user journey mapping where you actually kind of try to linearly map a journey of a user through your systems or through their job, actually. We actually completely refocused saying, let's not think about the platform. Let's think about what is the job of the developer. They start a project, right? At some point, they, they start writing code, and then that code needs to go into production, right? And then that needs to be running in production. And within that, you can go level deeper and say, okay, when they start a project, they, they have a bootstrapping um, phase where they might have subtasks like, oh, I need a Git repository, I need my IDE set up, maybe I want code spaces, then I want to discover, is there APIs I can use, is there managed databases in the company, then at some point I start writing code, so I have inner loop development, I then go into CI, into CD, and at some point I'm in production and I want to ensure reliability. And once you have this high level journey, then you can go in and think about in which phases can I add to this process? Can my platform enable the developer 
or can can I help the company accomplish something like a security uh, policy? And it's not about also focusing just on a single space there. It's about thi thinking about like where does this like in the process hang? So like just think about uh, uh, policy management, right? We think about policy management and then like at, we are at KubeCon and we are like, okay, there's two tools, it's Caverno or Gatekeeper or some other tools. So I put them in the cluster and I have policy management. That's not how we should think about it, right? We should think about like, how do I get policy management as easy as possible to our developers? So let's say we have repo templates. So c could I give the developer in the template already some kind of base policies? Could I help them adhere to pod security standards, for example, by having something in the template already that helps them get started, shifting everything left, shifting the real capability of my platform towards the end user. And then already in CI and in internal uh, uh, developer loops, I want to validate that everything works so there's no surprise once the developer goes into production and they're like, no, you forgot to have at network policies. Right? I want to think about the whole chain and this is how I can think about much more holistic capabilities of the developer. And I can think about more and I can break up also team barriers because oftentimes when you grow your platform teams, you might have an observability team and a security team and a connectivity team and all these kind of different teams. And if you completely t treat them separately, they're not gonna accomplish that much because the integration it is what makes it, right? You wanna have integrated services and I'm gonna show you an example where this makes a lot of sense to most. But before we go to that example, let's talk about risk. Because that's really dear to my heart. When you build platforms, we've been there, right? We've had paths in the past. It's not something new. There's been platforms that enable developers and people have loved things like Heroku or even Cloud Foundry, these kind of things, because they help them um, get started very quickly and deploy code into production very quickly. But inherently, once you abstract away things, you also set limitations. And sometimes those limitations might be right, but oftentimes the more mature a developer gets, they hit these limitations. And if they're too hard, they will work like find workarounds. And these workarounds are quite ugly sometimes. Like not ugly in terms of like it's a bash script, uh, no bash bashing here, <laughs> but ugly in terms of they might go around sec security. They might not comply with your regulations. They might not have what um, the best practices inherently. They might even lead to complete shadow IT, shadow platforms, because they were not happy with your platform, right? because you limited them too much. Right? Sometimes compliance doesn't allow you to, to give so much freedom, but in most cases there is, there is a balance to be taken. And then once you start building, especially like internal uh, platform teams for a single company, you always focus on your company, right, naturally. You want to solve problems for your company. But there is a risk of building very bespoke platforms, very proprietary internal APIs, and doing everything like very close to your, to how your company, because your company is always special, right? Every company is special. We are different. Like every time you, you think about it, like we are different. We have more regulations. Yes, usually you're quite different. But there's also a lot of common denominators. Just look at this community, look at the end user community, everyone has a lot in common. And if you build it too specific for yourself, you risk getting stuck in the maintenance of your own things, right? And when, once you're, you're, you're forking things and building a lot of code yourself, you also risk getting overtaken by open source, right? If you've built your own app management, Helm deployment, GitOps system, and there's things from Flux and GitOps uh, and, and Argo out there, they might overtake you. But you might have not built in OCI support, and they already have it, and you have to always add these features. So trying to, to not kind of be too specific is, is, uh, is, is, is a good thing here. 
And then also we need to be careful because um, it's easy to lock in your lock yourself into a single technology or a single tool, and and tools naturally uh, promote that, right? You, um, but a tool change can be very painful, right? Uh, and in this ecosystem, tools change a lot, right? Standards change and. Uh, trends go through this ecosystem. It, uh, eBPF used to not be a thing like maybe five years ago, but now you might need to change your, your, your networking towards something like that. Or you might be currently using some, some tool from a, from a vendor that is VC funded. Maybe they get bought, maybe they can't continue. What happens to the tool? Right? And some strategies and naturally we're at KubeCon and Open Source Summit here. The answer for me is always open source and community standards. And the risk reduction strategies, it's not just like, yeah, just use open source. It's also to think about when you're choosing the right um, yeah, building blocks for your platform, think about is this, this, this building block that I'm using is, is maybe a multi-vendor open source, like not being dependent on a single vendor is very good, right? Foundation uh, membership can be uh, quite helpful in that because, I mean, we've seen companies changing licenses recently. And this can be very painful if you have to migrate away from that. Like maybe someone steps up and has a foundation alternative <laughs> like we've seen, but sometimes it doesn't happen. And then you have to migrate away, and this distracts you from building value again as a platform team, right? It's a huge project, and all your backlog is going to be delayed by that. And really, really importantly for me is also building on community standards, right? This will also abstract away a bit the actual tool, right? If you use things like Gateway API, or other APIs like CSI, CNI, all these, these community standards, these uh, abstraction levels that, we, that we've been working on in, in the community, then it's easier for you to change out the underlying tool without having to change the way your developers work. Right? And sometimes that means also you might introduce some additional abstractions. But trying to work on community standards and not build your own abstractions is always uh, recommendable here. And going back to this first point here of like path-like abstractions, make abstractions pokeable if you can. I'm a big fan of having at least, like especially if you look, work, for example, in a GitOps uh, way, having at least view rights for developers on the platform and them at some point maybe maturing into contributing to your platform and seeing like actually changing, changing things and fixing bugs for you. You don't need to give them merge rights, right? You, but at least giving them the opportunity to escalate and say, hey, you didn't think about my use case. Um, I don't know, I need TPUs instead of GPUs. You didn't think about that. Could we change that for me? And having this, at least the process that is easy and, and uh, doesn't block the developer, so they don't need to go with their own credit card to Amazon and just uh, build their own machine on the side. Right. And thinking about both now the product view and this like building on standards, I wanted to run through like a very common example that we see oftentimes, right? It's like progressive rollouts. It's a typical use case of thinking how to connect uh, different tools. And here again, what is the job to be done? It's not the progressive rollout itself, right? It's not getting Flagger into production or something like that. The job to be done is I want to roll out an iteration of my code into production. I want to get business value delivered. It's, that's the only job that I have as a developer, right? It's not going through the pipeline. Right? That's, the job is just getting there. And for that, I need release engineering capabilities to build and to deploy software. There's some connectivity capabilities if you want to dynamically route to like canary or blue-green blue deployments here. Uh, there, there's some observability capabilities where you want to maybe actively monitor and automatically actually roll back and roll forward 
into new versions, deliver more traffic to the new version, and then slowly uh, um, phase out the old version. And because security is important, we want also the whole supply chain of this software to be trusted and secure. Right? So now a question, how many tools do I need? How many CNCF tools do I need for this? Rough ballpark. 10? 57? Depends. I think it depends on how you count, right? Like, where do you start and when do you stop? Just let's look at, like, just the base one. Right? And this is really, this is not a recommendation. You can use any tool out there for this. You can build your own. But this is one selection of CNCF tools that would most probably work together in this way, right? Like, let's assume we're in a GitOps world. We use Flux and Flagger to trigger a Canary or blue-green deployment here. And then we use Gateway API as standard, right? And behind that, we could use a service mesh like Linkerd or I don't know, maybe something from Cilium. We need a Gateway API compatible ingress controller like Contour or there's others out there to dynamically route traffic to my new service, to the new version. And then I use, for example, something like Prometheus or something compatible to that to observe this new traffic, observe my new service, and then give feedback back to Flagger and to Gateway API to direct more, more uh, to like roll out the complete service into production, right? And the six store, that's the three tools, by the way. So you said like six store three. Six store uh, cosign, for example, to, to uh, sign my images and trust the supply chain. And then I want to check for those signatures in the cluster. Let's say we use uh, Kiverno or Gatekeeper for that. So we have a secure supply chain. But that's just the main use case, right? I also have, I don't know, maybe cluster API to, to manage my apps and uh, my clusters. And then I should build images and store them somewhere. So I need a registry. That registry should also adhere to standards, like the OCI standard again, right? And maybe I get a hosted one or I host my own harbor, right? And we talked about interfaces. It's a complex use case. The developer wants to give, get, like, maybe visual feedbacks to that. Maybe I integrate it with uh, Backstage. And I think Flux just announced the Backstage plugin. Alex was tweeting about it. So, that's, again, another tool, another plugin that you need to, to manage. And this is just one capability, right? It's just one capability out of many that you want to give your ones. But this is one of the core ones, and you can integrate more into these, right? And this is just to make, make clear that, like, it's, it's not that easy, right? It's, uh, it's, it's a complex system we live in. And to, to survive here, we need to basically stand on the shoulder of giants. And to summarize, Basically, what we talked about today is, yes, developer platforms need to enable the developer. And while we do that, especially the higher we are in the management level, we need to understand and not underestimate the effort. Right? There's a lot of people that are needed, a lot of resources that are needed to build these developer platforms. They're not easy to build. And while we're building them, we need to really focus on a product mindset on tools like jobs to be done or, or user journey mapping. And everyone in the team needs to understand those, like, especially in engineering. It's not something like you hire a product engineer, a product manager, and they solve it for you. You need also to enable the, the whole team towards that. Then to avoid the risk, build on open source. Don't build that much yourself. Try to see if there's products out there that can help you, that package some of that, that help you with, with choice. Talk to people. Talk to people at KubeCon about your choices. And for me also, much more importantly, is stay true to the core of open source. And try to, if you find use cases that don't fit, talk to upstream. Right? Involve yourself. And it's actually quite easy and nice to become contributors. And it's very rewarding. I know it can also be distracting, but in some cases it might be the better investment of your time because once you have your use case supported by upstream, you don't need to maintain it anymore. The community maintain it, maintains it, right? And you don't need to carry the patch or fork or uh, reintegrate every time things change, right? 
And hopefully, if you rely on these, you as a platform team and, and as a company that is using platform teams and, 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 and working with platform teams, you, sh you, you can be happy and also really appreciate it because you're really enabling the developer, you're caring for them, you're ha helping them adopt these technologies. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Hello. So thank you for your presentation. Quick question, like how do you measure velocity of successful patrol teams and what are their measurements? Yeah. So it, it's very company specific, I would say, but there's some frameworks that are not bad, like a DORA matrix, for example, I can recommend. That's uh, a good one. I would be careful, though, to put very specific KPIs in there. Right? It's like you should always measure but being too data driven can also be risky because data can lag or be biased. Right? But Dora Metrics is a, is a good framework. Um, also, there's existing tooling and dashboards for that. But I would also s think about go and talk to engineering departments, engineering managers, and ask them, like for example, with this user journey map that we created, we went with that map to end users and ask them which part is slow for you, which part is painful even, right? Maybe it's not even slow, but it's just painful, right? And do the same thing even with the platform teams. Which part is pain painful for the platform teams? And they'll sometimes tell you like, nobody knows that we have databases as a service. <laughs> right? So then you can incre uh, have a measurement for that like adoption rates. I, I love adoption rates as, as measurements because it shows that people are actually using it. Right? And this is why like, it, it's very company specific, I would say, but talking to people will help you find the, the right measurements for you. I want to ask a question about how, how are the responsibilities divided mm -hmm. between the platform team and the application developers. Mm. Some, some tasks are not so clear, like if an uh, application requires public uh, internet access, who should be responsible for configuring the, or uh, maintaining the load balance and the DNS config? Mm. Okay. It's not an easy one. Responsibility is, is always hard, and usually you, you would strive to have clearly defined roles and clearly defined responsibilities and make the limits very clear. I do believe that something like, for example, a load balancer and DNS are still on the platform side. The developer shouldn't need to care that much about it. But sometimes you have this case, and this is where I was saying, like, if you make your system pokeable, some like if you manage it as a platform team, you need to manage your resources and you need to set some limitations on what you can give as an SLA, as a, as a, as a service agreement. And then if you have a team that needs to go way beyond that, has very specific needs for that, you might need to say, okay, you team, if you need that, I cannot provide it, you need to, to manage that yourself. But making the the, the, the lines very clear is, very, is, 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 is important here. Um, usually I would say try to standardize and keep ownership within the platform teams. And then have good interfaces towards the developer, how they can use it in a safe manner. And only like in rare cases try to like move the ownership over there. It's still hard because um, maybe it breaks, the load balancer breaks because of misconfiguration. Because, uh, I don't know, wrong certificates in the ingress resource. If you have a lot of wrong certificates in ingress resources, some ingress controllers might fall over. Right? Then it's not the responsibility of the platform team anymore, but it's, it's the platform team's responsibility that takes care of the ingress, that they work with their engineers, why are you like what like and find out why why are these misconfigurations happening 
and trying to avoid them in the future, either by helping with templating better or automating things that can be automated, I would say. Does, does that solve your question, Rafi? Thank you. Uh, thanks for sharing. I just have a question regarding to how to really attract the developed team to really use the platform product that the protect, uh, protect, uh, pro, uh, platform teams are actually delivered. Just like you mentioned, some, some, sometimes there will be fun time workaround solution to just uh, work around like the security check, something like that. Mm. So any best practice for it? So it's hard to avoid, right? It's like yeah. you, you don't have visibility everywhere. But um, I think the way that you, once you realize that, or like to avoid it even from the get-go is to make things easier, mm -hmm. right? Um, if everyone's running around with root access, it's most probably because it's really hard to do like fine-grade permission control. So maybe then you need to invest in either a tool or building some permission management. So may, like, it's, it's usually about a usability problem where people get, go towards workarounds or build around security. And especially in the security case, it's you need to work very closely with the end users to see what helps them. Because oftentimes with security use cases, it's like, here's all the CVEs, fix them. Doesn't work, right? 800 CVEs. But if you can prioritize them, help them prioritize it, give it to some product teams then, and then also maybe even create issues for them in Jira. Like we, we've built an, a Jira integration for CVEs at some point to make it easier for them to prioritize and, uh, and understand why it's important. Okay, thank you. And uh, also another question is around the value of the platform. Mm. Because uh, I would see that we will be facing some challenges from the management team, <laughs> especially for SIO. And you guys know that uh, when the investment or the budget for the platform is really huge, mm. so how really show the business value when mm. we uh, establish that kind of platform product? Yeah, Business value is, is not easy. It, a little bit goes back to the first question of like, Usually, at some point in management level, they understand like developer velocity to be important for a company, like any company, not only tech companies, software is becoming important. And if the company hasn't understood that yet, then, uh, then we have more work to do, then we might, might need a bit more strategy consulting to get them understand. But if, the, if it's understood that software is, is really contributing value to the, 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 the revenue of the company. I mean, in retail, it's easy because it's e-commerce oftentimes, but in some companies, it's maybe not that easy. But once that's understood, making clear that this platform and showing that this platform is actually enabling developers to, to like deliver value faster and with less downtime and with less problems, so we get less uh, support tickets, like measuring these and then showing that back to management that helps and also um, sometimes you need like bigger new projects or you might need a new team. Packing that into the business value that this will provide into the value that, that you expect from this, like an automated rollout feature, you expect features to land much quicker and with, with, le uh, with less problems into produ in production. So showing that and bringing it up to the level of saying, okay, this will save us X amount of time and or this, um, for example, usually you can s say something about time uh, spent uh, currently, right? Like how much time does the, do you take from uh, inception to go production, right? And if you, if you can then say, okay, we, we are definitely saving time here and this new project will save more time then that's something that you, you can use for budget negotiations and, and trying to expand the team. Okay, thank you. I, I make a very quick question because we are over time. Oh yeah, right, actually. Um, it's lunch. You just had one spicy take in it with the not uh, committing too much on a tool and then go on the thing. Um, I experienced this heavily in a place I worked before. You spend so much effort to not lock in yourself into a tool. So 
is this not contradicting each other to say, okay, we want to be quick, we want to be fast, mm -hmm. but then we want to stay on a, such a high level, not taking the benefits of maybe everything, because then we mm -hmm. are too deep into the tool. What is your take on this? It's, it's a fine line to tread. I, I fully agree. It's if you if you're too careful and you build like everything abstracted away and like moving between all the clouds and all the tools, it's it's gonna be way too much. Right? But trying at least where it's possible and even given to you maybe by the community, like CNI, CNI, Gateway API, all these tools that maybe the community already has worked on, and checking if there is people that have worked on, on abstractions already, at least adopting those, and for those not going too deep, it'll be hard. It still doesn't work always, right? It's like even with network policies, which are a common component, sometimes you need more, and then you need to go into your specific tool and, 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 uh, and think about, and, and, and use the, the specific functionality. And sometimes it's really beneficial because you get more secure, you get faster, and you get, uh, um, a lot of power. It's uh, it's just something that you need to think about, especially when you see already things on the horizon. Like if you're currently working for with on validation, let's say, in Kubernetes clusters, there's a lot of tools that you can r use right now, and they're all proprietary. And then core Kubernetes is currently use it, like trying to introduce cell and other validation mechanisms back into core. Maybe those can replace some of your use cases in the future. If you're thinking about that, maybe now investing in a bit of abstraction will help you migrate uh, in the future if you can already anticipate it a little bit. Cool, I think you all want lunch. Everyone is hungry a little bit. Thank you. <laughs>